Okay, so it's 11 o'clock. We'll be we'll be start, starting momentarily. So this is uh, Piotrek Swiss from Harvard Medical School as Big Red, and uh, this is our uh, last webinar of the current session. Uh, just a couple of technical notes. If you guys have any technical difficulties, you can uh, use the chat window and send me a private message. And um, I'll be also moderating the session. If you have any questions to, to Clemens, please uh, send them to me in the chat. And uh, I'll moderate it to him at the end of the at the end of the session. So we are scheduled for for about 30 minutes, and then after 30 minutes, we'll have a couple minutes for questions. So uh, we'll we'll start without a uh, big introduction. Clemens Wongheim from Global Phasing. Uh, let's let's just get going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a first for me actually this webinar, so it's quite exciting. I hope nothing goes wrong and everything stays um, online. So I'm going to talk a bit about experimental phasing and stock solution with Sharp AutoSharp, and I'll hope to stay within the 30 minutes. So let's get started. Um, I was told to do a bit uh, a system check slide. Yeah, so we we all we all set we all ready. Yeah. Everything is fine. Okay. Let's go. So uh, I'm going to talk about AutoSharp mainly, but um, which is an auto automated pipeline for stock solution for experimental phasing. But I also want to talk a little bit about non-automated stock solution because quite often you know, the interesting bit is when the automated stock solution doesn't quite work. Um, and that's where most of the questions come along as well. I get uh, maybe a bit of time to go into a bit more advanced examples about radiation damage maybe, but also about heavy atom clusters. And uh, the main thing is usually we've got a fair amount of tutorials on our web pages. So if you go to the uh, globalphasing.com sharp web page or to the wiki, there should be um, a lot of information that you can, can walk through. So what is AutoSharp? Well, AutoSharp basically is an expert system or an automated pipeline which does what you as an exper experienced user would do by hand. So it's a typical kind of um, layout. You, you come in with a bit of data, you've got your reflection data, you know hopefully the sequence of, of the protein what you've, that you crystallized. You should know your prime of double prime value when you do experimental phasing from your fluorescent scan. And together with all that, you, you put it into a slightly iterative procedure where you do a bit of check, you analyze your data, scaling, um, you try to find your heavy atom um, detection. Uh, maybe you, know, you don't find all of the solutions, all of the heavy, at heavy atoms, but you start with a bit of refinement, and maybe you can improve this initial heavy atom model by finding additional sites, deleting sites. And once this has converged, you have some phases from the heavy atom phasing program, and you still need to determine the hand. So I'll go into detail a little bit about that later. Um, we always do density modification these days uh, to get a nice map. And if you've got a very nice map, you can feed it into automatic building programs. And hopefully, you end up with an initial model um, or an already quite complete model. So that's the idea. That's what we all did uh, by hand in uh, bad or good old days, depending on your view. But um, AutoShop tries to simplify things. Um, a bit of, of design to, to, to get rid of some confusion, maybe. So we've got AutoSharp and we've got Sharp. Sharp is basically the core of the AutoSharp procedure. It's a, a heavy atom refinement and phasing program where the idea is to get you the best phases possible. And it can apply to a large variety of phasing scenarios. So it's very general. And uh, we try to keep in these kind of traditional names of phasing scenarios like MAD or SAD or SIR, but Sharp doesn't know about them. Imagine you collected a, a data set because you were absolutely sure this is going to solve this molecular replacement. It's got 35% sequence homology. It's going to be a piece of cake, and then it doesn't work. And then you go back to the web lab, and you do your selenomat expression, for example, and you go to the synchrotron, and you collect a beautiful three-wavelength mat experiment, and it also doesn't work. So Sharp has no problem in then combining the mat data that in the native because you obviously um, have the difference between the selenium methionine and the sulfur methionine. So the difference between selenium and sulfur is also source of phase information. So Sharp can handle all of these more complicated phasing scenarios. Um, the only problem is because it's very general, um, you, you have to sometimes give a lot of information. So you have to build up all this data structure, which for the start of a stock solution or for a beginner can be quite overwhelming. So what we did is we implemented this AutoSharp pipeline, which basically um, extends the Sharp procedure upstream to 
put all the data together and to scale them if it's necessary and also um, go downstream to do the density modification, hand detection, automatic model building. And so it's much easier. We only uh, work with the common phases now, it's like MAD, SAD, FIR, MIR, but that's most of the time what you're actually going to start with when you do your uh, experimental phasing. The advantage of limiting to the simple type of scenarios is that you need only a minimum amount of input, so it's much easier to get started. The second advantage is that the AutoSharp procedure can be much more verbose in explaining exactly what's going on. So there should be warning messages or notes, and they're usually quite helpful in then figuring out where you might be able to improve things or if something goes wrong, what, what it was that triggered that error. Um, very shortly, because I think part of the idea of this webinar is um, to introduce a new Sharp server that I think SPQuit is going to install or has installed on, on new machines. Um, this is the, the Sharp control panel that you will see roughly. Um, you have two buttons, so you can either start auto Sharp procedure or the Sharp procedure, and maybe the, the third important one is, to, is the results button, which will get you to the results. But I'm not going to, to go into more technical detail here. Um, another interface that you might want to play with is, a CC, is in CCB4i, it's distributed with CCB4, but again, it looks very similar to um, the one that, that you see if you go to the SPQuit Sharp server. Um, again, the, the important bits are you have to have your data files, and you said scale pack. Maybe also HKL should work, but I don't think a lot of people using it. It's most of the time MPZ or scale pack file. You should have an idea about the number of heavy atom sites. Um, if you do with methionine, that's, that's very clear. You, you can just count the, the MET residues in your sequence. That's fine. If you do SOAKs, you have to go a little bit with this kind of experience values. You should know the type of the heavy atom that you are looking for, or at least the predominant one. And um, the optional information is a sequence, wavelength, F prime, double prime, and space group. Um, bit of information, so the sequence, you should always know what you crystallized. I mean, that might, might be a case where you're not quite sure if there's some truncation or how long your construct is, but you should have at least a rough idea. Um, wavelength actually is not really important because a heavy atom phasing program relies on the F prime, double prime values. You know, these are the atomic properties, uh, the scattering properties of the heavy atoms. And ideally, especially if you collect close to the edge, um, peak, inflection, this kind of data sets, you should always do a fluorescence scan to get the F prime of double prime value. And you should also save the fluorescence scan, so don't just use it for picking the wavelength that you're going to collect as a synchrotron and forget about it. You should always uh, bring it back home because it, it's useful to know these values. The space group, um, yes, you know, you should, should be fairly confident about your space group. Obviously, at that point, you can distinguish between something like P4 sub 1 and P4 sub 3. So there are nothing more space groups um, that have to be sorted out in real space once you do the phasing and density modification. The first step, what AutoSharp does is, which is very quick but also quite helpful, is it does a lot of analysis. It looks for indexing possibilities if you have several space data sets in P4 sub 3. For example, there are indexing alternatives. It will sort them out. It does various plots, these correlation plots on anomalous differences to get you an idea about anomalous signal. It looks for outliers. It does bifurcation functions, native patterns, Matthews program. It does um, all not rocket science, but it's very helpful to have, to have them in one place and have them explained in the output. The first step, and, and to some extent for experimental phasing, the most important one is a heavy atom detection. So in general, um, you need to have much better data and you need to be much more brutal to your data in terms of outliers and high resolution cut for the heavy atom detection than you would need to actually solve your structure. So it is these, uh, the first step of analysis is very important for the heavy atom detection. So in AutoSharp, instead of reinventing the wheel, we're, going, we're using the Shellix C and D programs from Short Shell Trick because they're doing a very good job. And we're basically running them in a very simplistic way. Um, you would, could also run them by hand outside um, if, you, if you need to fine tune parameters. But it, it does a good job most of the time. The important thing is what you want to see at that point is you want to have some indication that the heavy atom solution is at least roughly right. So the typical plots are produced where you have for each site, you've got an occupancy and it's a linear at for example, again, and you expect each side to be fully occupied, you would have a nice line of high high sides and then a big drop and then all the wrong sides. So that's what you're going to look for. 
Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen that nicely, especially if you do soaks, you don't have a, a drop in occupancy. Here. So another tool are these scatter plots where you would like to have a whole bunch of solutions with high values, which are the correct solutions, and a whole bunch of solutions with low values, which are the, the wrong solutions. And there should be some difference, some contrast between them. And sometimes if you look for a lot of sites, you might have a situation where you've got a whole bunch of correct solutions and then something in between, which could be maybe half the sites are correct and half of, half of them are incorrect. Clement, this one for a second. Sorry yep. for a second. A couple, couple of people mentioned they cannot see the whole screen on their monitors. Do, do you have a really high resolution on your end? No, it's actually an old-fashioned um, 4 by 3 monitor. So, so up like to where can they see it? They say on the bottom it, it kind of cuts off, I wonder. Because on my screen I can see okay, so I wonder if you have like more than 1020, 4 by 768. Or... Um, I could have, I, th I think I have higher than 1024. You want me to try and reset it or? Yeah, if you can maybe switch to a lower, a bit lower resolution. Now, let me see if I can. Oh, you have the. And I can do that. Um... So you have 920 by 12, yeah. I've got, well, no, that, that's that's the other screen. Yep. So I've got two screens yep. in funny. Yep. Okay. But, yeah. let's, um, just, let's just do that, yeah. Let me try that one. If anybody else has, has problem, plus, 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 uh, please send me a message because right now I just have three people. If it's just three people, we'll just keep going. But, uh, so now I'm running at 1024. Okay. I guess which is kind of the common. Right, so I think people with the smaller screens should be okay right yeah. now. Okay, they, they say it now it looks okay. Okay, that's, that's fine then. Okay, so everybody said it fixed it. Thank you, thanks. So uh, we are at the heavy atom detection stage and hopefully um, we have a good indication that our heavy atom solution is, is fairly right. And the next step is then we're trying, going to try and improve on that um, initial heavy atom solution. So we're going to enter the SHARP program within the auto SHARP pipeline, and here we're going to do the heavy atom refinement and phasing. It does a, a couple of other things. It does an overall anisotropic scaling, for example. So uh, if you've got very anisotropic data, it will take out the anisotropy, which has a big impact later on in the density modification. Um, the, the density modification will, will hopefully produce better maps that. One of the main features of the SHARP program are these so-called log-like gradients or residual maps. And so they've been, been around for quite some time now, and they are very, very powerful. They're a little bit like a different Fourier map. So they will show positive density where you have to put something in, and negative where you have to take something out. But in the typical FO minus FC different Fourier map, you only have basically atoms as a, as a mean to put something in. Here with SHARP, um, you have the atom model, Remember, it doesn't only consist of your heavy atom sites. It also consists of your scaling parameters, of non-isomorphism, of your d-factor model. Is it isotropic or anisotropic? And especially also of, on your f-prime and f-double prime values. So sometimes if you find positive peaks on all your seleniums for one wavelength, it, in the anomalous look like the gradient map, it means that your f-double prime is too low, is wrong. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to do fluorescence scans or you actually start with reasonably good values and you don't have to then hunt around and try and refine them. Um, it, within AutoSharp, we're going to use these look like good gradient maps to first of all remove sites that were, you know, that are clearly not in the in the heavy atom model. We are going to add additional sites, minor sites, maybe even split sites. We automatically automatically switch on refinement of a prime or a double prime if it's very obvious, and we then feed back the, uh, the whole new heavy atom model in a, another round of SHARP. And this procedure we're going to iterate until we, we come up with a reasonably complete and converged heavy atom model. At that point, we still don't know what which is our two hands. So in heavy atom phasing, you always have the possibility to have your sites at x, y, and z, or at minus x, minus y, minus z, and then switch to the enantiomorph base group. So it's important to remember it's only two possibilities that you have. So you, if you have 
let's say p4 sub 1, in one hand you don't have to invert, you have atom side can stay in p4 sub 1 and then you know, do all the combinations for possibilities, as soon as you invert the hand of the heavy atoms, you switch automatically to the enantiomorph. So there are only two possibilities, heavy atom phasing. Now, how do we figure out which of the two hands is actually correct? Well, we have to go into real space. In the same way in molecular placement, you figure out which one is your correct space group by actually trying to solve it in P4 sub 1 and in P4 sub 3 in the two enantiomorph, and only one will give you a solution. So here is the same thing. We're going into real space. We're doing density modification. And the idea is that you have one set of phases in one hand, which will give you a good map, and one set of phases in the other hand, which will give you a bad map. And this way, we can figure out which one is the right hand. But this is only part of the, the advantage of doing the density modification here. The pure fact that we actually get a contrast between the two hands also shows us that we are on the right track and that we have a heavy atom model that, that leads to some meaningful phases. So if you get um, uh, scores or values for these two map maps, for these two hands, that are basically identical, it just means that you've got a wrong heavy atom model, which gives you wrong phases, and then it doesn't matter if you switch to the other hand or you invert the, uh, the heavy atom model. So it's, it's important to do that at this point here. We also automatically optimize our solvent content because that might help us in uh, judging how many molecules we actually have in the arsenic unit. Uh, quite often, if you if you have only a single molecule, Matthews parameter is very very clear, and you know it's absolutely um, there's no alternative to a single molecule or maybe two. But if you got six, eight, ten, twelve molecules, it's not quite clear which how many molecules you will have in the arsenic unit. Which obviously later on, if you want to do the NCS averaging, you need to do building. It's important. Right, next step is we hopefully have a nice map. And um, if it's a nice map, you can start building. But we all are lazy, and there are very good programs out there to help you in automatic building. So within AutoSharp, we're using, by default, the ARP Warp suite of programs. And in the next Sharp or AutoSharp release, we also have a path that will use Buccaneer. So we're taking the results from the heavy atom phasing plus the density modification, hopefully the best map. And then we're going to do an automatic building. So what do you actually get at the end of an AutoSharp run? You get a lot of plots, Katie Patterson, Zelf rotation, different Patterson, or the Harker sections, and a lot of tables and numbers. They are usually all commented, though so there should it should be a little bit easier, especially for beginners, to to find out what they actually mean. Um, and some of them might be actually a bit old fashioned, but they're still they're still valid. You also get uh, um, all the data that scaled to each other, including alternative indexing. Possibility. So if you if you work on a project where a single data set just isn't enough, and you have to combine different data sets, and you have maybe issues with crystal reproducibility with non-isomorphism, that can be quite helpful. You get initial uh, heavy atom size and refined heavy atom size. Now that can be helpful later on when when you're looking at your model and you're just wondering what this funny water peak there is. Uh, go back to your heavy atom model or these look look like an gradient maps and actually. You, you might find, oh, that was actually not a, a, just a water. It was maybe modeled as a, as a calcium. So um, then it's no wonder that it looks a bit funny if you model it as a water. So the heavy atom model is obviously all, always co um, present, even if you do the refinement later on. You get the sharp phases. You get these look like your gradient maps. You get density modified phase and maps. And hopefully, you get an initial model coming out of our warp, which is already quite, quite well refined. Now, there's a whole bunch of tools around Sharp Auto Sharp, and they're all, or most of them are available through the interface that you're going to use within the SPQuid Sharp server, um, from NCS detection, extraction of Hendrix and Lettman coefficients, different Fourier maps. You can, um, you can fine tune the density modification. You can start after your initial Auto Sharp run. You can do MAD plus native. You can do a cluster compound, um, all kinds of things. And we're going to look at a couple of them. But the important thing is always when AutoSharp gives you a warning message, um, it usually tries to explain what's going on. And a lot of these warning messages actually point back to processing and scaling problems. Um, so with anything we do in af after uh, we collect our data, the data, well, obviously the collection itself, the strategy will be used there, but also data processing and the scaling is very important. And with experimental phasing, 
Um, things like beanstalk ice rings decay can be a real headache. So anything that produces outliers or systematic errors will be problems. For example, AutoSharp might give you information like the complete is below 90% in the low resolution range. Now that can be a serious problem later. In principle, 90% doesn't sound that bad, but the, pro the question is, are these 90% just randomly uh, distributed within the low resolution, or is it maybe overload? So if you're missing 10% of the strongest, most juicy reflection in the low resolution, and this will be a severe problem. Um, so that is the kind of warning you would get here. Or maybe it gives you um, a warning that there are additional sites that you haven't accounted for. So you think, well, I've got six selenium, so I'm looking for six selenium, and suddenly a peak into looks like you can create a map of 14 sigma pops up. Maybe there's something else, and maybe you should go back to the literature and figure out that your protein needs zinc or, or has an iron core factor or who knows what in there. Other warning messages, um, yeah, we're probably not going, going to much detail here. But um, that's, uh, the idea is that AutoSharp will, will comment them and makes it a bit easier for you to figure out what all these numbers and plots mean. These look like like and gradient maps can be extremely uh, powerful in analysis. Uh, so, for example, um, if you look on the left-hand side, you could have a typical picture of a split methionine. So very often, your selenium methionine or also methionine side chains are actually um, in two alternate conformations because if you rotate the, uh, the sulfur or selenium around, it basically occupies the same space. So here you would have in green your current heavy atom model, in blue negative density, and in red positive. And it, it can mean two things. It could either mean that you have to switch from an isotropic defect to an anisotropic. So at the poles, the north pole and the south pole, you have to take something out, and at the equator, put something in. It could be an anisotropic defector. Or the fact that it's, it's much stronger on this side could mean that it's, it's a split side, or something in between. And if it's, if it's easy to interpret these log like gradient maps, it always helps to, to start modeling things and put these additional 10% of, of phase information out of your data. They're actually also very, very sensitive. So even if you collect a selenium peak, you might find another eight sigma peak, and you wonder what it could be, because you already found your two seleniums that are in the sequence. So even at selenium peak, you might find an anomalous signal for sulfur which if you have to trace your, your structure and it's very unclear, can be actually quite helpful to know where the cysteine is. As I mentioned, it's important to find at least some kind of difference between the scores of the original inverted hand so that you know that you're on the right track. You can feed back your density modified phases into sharp to improve your log like gradient maps, and you can also feed back a partial model, for example, into density modification and or sharp. So what does that mean? Um, there's an example which is distributed with CCB4. You can also run it directly from our uh, from the tutorial section of our web pages. And it's 2.7 angstrom. If you run it through AutoSharp, it works quite well. And at the end of AutoSharp, you end up with a model where out of the 440 amino acids, about 250, so let's say half of them are built, 100 of them are, are docked. So you end up with something that we know, okay, I can see helices, density looks okay, that's, that's fine. You could start building into it, but obviously being lazy, you can just say, okay, let's now put this model back into density modification, and instead of starting from the pure sharp, we're starting from the sharp plus model phases. It should be a bit better. We do another round of density modification, build a couple more, it docks a little bit more, we take that model again, another cycle, or oh, suddenly it builds 310 and docks, you know, doubled the amount, or 240. And you can, you can keep going a little bit, and in the end, you basically have four of six molecules more or less built, and the two molecules that aren't built um, is due to high B factors compared to the other four. Well, that has been around quite some time now, and it's what we call external phase information. And we can use external phase information in, in a very general way in the likelihood function in sharp. They're often called a so-called hendrix letman coefficient that you're probably familiar with. It come from density modification or non-isomorphous non crystals or from the partial model. And you've probably heard recently, uh, you know, talks about the so-called MRZ uh, procedure. And that's basically if you have a partial model and you use the phases from that model to find your heavy atom sites, 
um, and you have a single a fair data set. Now, SHARP and AutoSharp are, again, a bit more general, and we called it external face information uh, for a long time, but it can, it can be used for stabilizing parameter refinement, it can be used for heavy atom detection, and it can overcome non-isomorphism issues. The nice thing is it cannot just be used with SAD, it can be used with anything. So again, these, these kind of traditional names, SAD, MAD, NIR, SIR, it doesn't really have any meaning with, with AutoSharp and Sharp, so you could call it X, FUS, X, Y, that, or whatever. It's, a, it's very helpful. It uh, can, when, when you have a problem case where you have a partial model and partial experimental phase, the combining them can be very powerful. And just quickly, that is what it's going to look like in the next um, interface. So it will be very easy in AutoSharp to just dump a partial model that you have from a, from a poor molecular placement solution and actually find your sites and um, source your structure. Now, very quickly, going to bit, uh, something a bit old, maybe. So why are we not, not very often nowadays talk about MIR? So usually, um, in all the workshops, tutorials, examples, we do MAD or now even SAD. But one of the reasons we, we not, usually don't like MIR is there is non-isomorphism issues. You have to get data that's from different crystals. You have to soak them, co-crystallize them. It's just a headache. The second problem is you don't usually know the, the number of sites and the occupancy very well. One of the main reasons it's old-fashioned. MIR has been around for a long time, and so you know we don't like things or, that are old-fashioned. We have to be modern. However, there is still a good reason why there are still a lot of MIR structures being done, and there usually it's actually the, the difficult projects um, which go on for years that, where people just have to get a very good heavy atom signal. And the reason is with, with heavy atom soaking, soaking, you can get a very spectacular signal. It can be also very, very fast. It can be much faster doing uh, or trying a couple of heavy atom soaks than going back into the wet lab and doing expression of selenomat, and then the expression system doesn't work and it doesn't crystallize anymore and uh, can be also quite tricky. Remember, these soaks, it can be used for SAD and MAD too. So you don't have to do sulfur SAD or selenomat. Um, SAD and MAD um, have nothing to do with, with the type of heavy atoms that you're going to use. And there are some good statistics. So an example of a typical MIR uh, compound that, they, that people use these days is tantalum bromide cluster. And these clusters are actually quite nice because um, they're huge and they've got like tantalum or tungsten in them. And so at low resolution, they give, give you an absolutely gigantic heavy atom signal. But the problem at the same time is that they are very symmetrical. And because of symmetrical, they usually bind in a disordered way. So in every single unit cell, that they are uh, bound a little bit different. And on average, you will see a so-called spherical average cluster. And they then behave not like single atoms. They don't even behave like a, a single pseudo atom. They basically behave like a shell, and the form factor looks very weird against resolution, not like normal atoms. So in Sharp, we have a special SPH cluster for spherical cluster keyword, which can can model the form factor in this way and can actually extract quite good uh, phase information from these heavy atom clusters. Now, I was going to go for a very, very short intermezzo of data processing, but I'll probably skip most of it. Important is that with heavy atom uh, experimental phasing, it is extremely important to do a very good experiment and to do a very good data processing, um, especially uh, handling low resolution, beam stop masking, overloads, can be crucial. So any outliers will, will be a problem. But if you're interested uh, in uh, most of the, the these slides, uh, the other examples are also on our our web page. Um, it's, a, it's a tool that we call Autoproc, which basically tries to automate um, your data processing, and um, it's very easy to handle. So just as an, as a, as an example, this is a very simple case, it's a sulfur sad case. Um, just using all the, the defaults, giving it a sequence file searching for five sulfurs, giving it the wavelength and the, the reflection file out of Autoproc. After 12 minutes uh, on, a, on a laptop, it's a small protein. Anyway, uh, you come out with basically a, a more or less refined model. And there may be a couple of rotor mass you have to tweak and maybe a couple of waters, but um, it comes out very, uh, very well. Um, okay, I'm going to skip an, a rather interesting example with multiple lattices where you can also um, actually quickly um, solve it 
um, even at lower resolution, so it's a 3.3 .3 angstrom data set. Now at 3.3 .3 angstrom data, um, you get this type of map, maps, which are actually quite good, especially at lower resolution. I, I actually like it if my protein has um, beta sheets. So looking for helices at 3.5, 4, 4.5, 5 angstrom data becomes quite tricky. And um, especially if you use these skeletons, which could can display, and you have a big, a big chunk of maps that you're looking at, um, if you rotate it around and you, you have some, some beta sheets, you some, sometimes get an orientation where you can then suddenly see uh, the skeletons aligned um, uh, perpendicular to the, to the plane, and then there's nothing on the left and the right. So I find these, these larger secondary structures like beta sheets are much easier to look for at low resolution. And indeed, in this case, it's actually quite easy then with a tool that, that we developed with Pirate and Buccaneer to actually at 3.4 angstrom to build. Um, nearly all of the 2,000 residues there. So, um, oh, nearly in time, not bad. So, as a summary, automation is great if it works. So, the important thing is you have to know where it doesn't work. Um, and so, AutoSharp tries to to give you a meaningful feedback and also give you these warning messages, and and that is that is something you should look at. So most of the time, some of these warning methods might be quite boring, but they are, they are still important checkpoints. And um, quite often, these, these warning messages and that feedback can point back to data processing. So don't, don't be afraid of having to reprocess your data two, three, four, five, six times, um, because you learn. Whenever you then start looking at your data and you see some, some funny features and you realize, oh, the data is really getting bad at the, at the end, maybe I had, need to take out the last 100 images because I've got radiation damage. Or you see something funny in, in resolution ranges where there are known ice rings and you have to deal with the ice rings at data processing. Or it complains about possible overloads or it complains about the low resolution. So there are always reasons why, why it is a good idea to keep the images on disk and maybe go back and process them two or three times until you're sure that you've done a good job. Um, if you think about phasing, you have to think about differences. So yes, we are also using these kind of names like mad and sad, but this is not what it's about. It's all about differences and how we describe them. So we've got anomalous differences within a data set. So it's the F plus minus F minus difference. You've got dispersive differences, which are the differences between different wavelengths in a mad experiment. You've got isomorphous differences between a native and a heavy atom stoke. Radiation damage can actually give you differences that you can phase on. Um, so this is what, what heavy atom phasing is about. And the important thing to remember is it's about signal over noise. So what you need is you need a good heavy atom signal. So that's like basically the, the strength of your differences, but they need to be uh, strong relative to the noise. So if you've got crystals that diffract like held, like lysosine to one angstrom and give you beautiful spots and you know, uh, overall R factors are merges of 2% to one angstrom, you've got extremely small noise, so you can also get away with a very small signal. But if your crystals are dying, they are anisotropic, they are split, they are non-reproducible, and they only give you five angstrom in one direction and six in the other, there is no point of trying sulfur or sad. And you have to say, okay, I've got very, no I will, will get very noisy data, data, I have to go for a very a large signal. So one has to uh, adapt the phasing strategy to the, to, the, to the behavior and the quality of, your, of the crystals as well. So MIR cancel will be very useful. The goal of all this, of any phasing program, but also of, of AutoSharp and Sharp, is to get you the best phases from the measured data. So if you, if you did a very good experiment, you really want to get all that information out of it. Acknowledgements, all that work is done within the group of Gerard Bicconi in Global Phasing in Cambridge. Don't be afraid of our .com emails and, and web addresses. All of our software is free to academics. There is a licensing uh, procedure to follow, but it's free to academics. Now, uh, most of the people to, that worked in Sharp are Klaus Flensburg, Sotak Paterak, Mark Schultz, um, Eric de la in the, in the very early days. Um, other people in our group, Peter Keller, Andrew Sharp, Oliver Smart, Tom Womack are working on the other things, data processing, um, macromolecular refinement. You can find all the information about our program on our webpage. 
we do make extensive use of other people's program. Though obviously, like like a lot of people, we use program from CCD4. We use Shell C and D from George Sheltek for the heavy atom detection, are more for the model building. And uh, we've had a lot of, of test data and feedback from, from our consortium members, from users, and that's very, very useful. So the idea is that we want to release um, the next Sharp Auto Sharp in July. I know that SBQuid has just installed a new Sharp server, so sorry guys, you might have to do an, uh, an upgrade, but it should be fairly painless uh, this time. But uh, this is the idea. And if, if it doesn't happen in July 2012, please um, moan to us and complain. And I think what are the major time. features that will be introduced in 2012? Um, the major features, um, the, the two are um, model building with, with a buccaneer kind of pipeline. So um, model building will, should work better at low resolution. It should also work faster. It can then also make better use of NCS. Um, so that should should work better, and the second one is making it easier to use partial models within the AutoSharp pipeline. So if you've got a, a poor molecular placement solution, um, and then want to make make sure that your heavy atom sites uh, are found and they are also on the right, same origin and the same hand as the heavy atom model, um, that is then a, a one button click as well. I think that that will be a really popular feature. Well, th thank you, Clemens. Thank you for a great presentation. And uh, I really wanted to encourage everybody to, to, to ask questions, no matter how basic or complicated they are. It's really, truly unique opportunity to, to have Clemens today and from Cambridge uh, uh, sharing his time with us. Uh, so I have a couple of questions uh, people sent me mm -hmm. in the chat during the presentation. Uh, I, I think you mentioned those meaningful numbers, plots, and tables. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think many of us work on the low resolution, so we don't really get to the stage when you have automatically built model at the mm -hmm. end of the exercise. What, what are the key numbers that would that would kind of validate, uh, after running sharp, validate that you really have uh, a useful map that, that will be worthwhile to, to try to interpret and, and build by hand if it's a lower resolution? Yes. So, so uh, what kind of low resolution are we talking about? Oh, it's not, you know, between three and four angstroms. Uh, okay, three, three and four is still, though, I've, it becomes really tricky if you're talking five to six angstrom. So there's, there's some kind of magic barrier between around three and a half, four angstrom where, where things are starting being different. But if it's three to four, um, my main stopping point would be the phasing power. So if you look at, now let me see if I can, if I can bring this up. See if I got a sharp run somewhere here. Um, I mean, this one is is a, is a much higher resolution um, run, but it, it basically gives you the same kind of information. So in the phasing statistics, there is a phasing power. So uh, I need to make that window a bit smaller, otherwise the resolution change. So what you see is you see um, the phasing power against resolution. And what you expect is, and, and that's basically the important bit of most of the plots that we have against resolution, it's not necessarily the absolute values that are important, it's a trend. So with the phasing power, you would expect that you've got very good phasing power at low resolution, and it's getting worse at high resolution. That is because at low resolution, we've got all the strong reflections that can be nicely integrated, so our signal over noise is very good. And so we can extract all these differences very accurately, and if we can do that, we can actually get phasing Better, better phasing information out of it. And at higher resolutions, it gets worse and worse because our noise creeps up and our signal gets lower. Now, if you got a plot like this, I would look at the resolution where it starts dropping below one. So even if we here got data to one point to two angstrom uh, resolution, if you would calculate a map, it would rather look like a 2.6, 2.7 angstrom map. Now, if you go back to low resolution, if you, let's say, have three angstrom data, if you if you get this drop at seven angstrom, you'll be in trouble. So there's, it, it's nearly impossible to do a good density modification. So let's talk pure density modification to extend your your seven angstrom phases to a three angstrom high resolution limit. At that point, you do rely on you need additional information, which could be either um, partial models if you're working on big complexes and you know let's say 60% of of the of the um, monomers already known as the PDB, and you can you can place them with molecular placement. That's a great tool. Um, obviously, the second very very good tool is NCS averaging. 
Um, so these are the kind of things that low resolution. The biggest, bigger problem actually to getting to that stage of, of looking at fading power is finding your heavy atom sites uh, if you're working with that low resolution. So finding heavy atom sites with like four or five angstrom resolution data with the typical Shellix D or HIS or these kind of programs can be very, very difficult because a lot of the statistics that it, they, these programs output assume that you've got um, you know, a certain type of resolution. So that can be very tricky. Um, you might have to, I mean, like the ribosome people, you might have to go back to um, clusters where you've got a huge signal and actually look at Harker sections and do it the old-fashioned way, trying to interpret the, the Harker sections, finding the initial foothold into your substructure by hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, from our own experience also, in terms of data processing pre before you actually do phasing, We've been running Autoprog. We've been really happy with it. Do, do you think that, that really right now it's, uh, from your experience, the best tool to, to get the – Autoprog is a, a, just up, runs on top of XDS. Do you think mm -hmm. it's uh, the best tool right now to, to kind of prepare data to make everything consistent when you're running Sharp or, or uh, HKL2000 and other, other packages would do equally well? I, I you think that – You really do a good job in that. It, it all depends. If, you, if you've got a, a normal – to good data set, it doesn't make a difference. And with the difficult data sets where you where you have smeared out spots or the crystal is dying or you've got multiple lattices or you've got huge ice rings, then it has more to do with, with people realizing what the problems are and then knowing how to drive a program um, mm -hmm. to, to get to get to deal with these problems. So I I wouldn't say that sharp requires, you know, uh, an XDS process data, an autoproc process data. It should work equally well with other, other data sets. One of the advantages of autoproc is if you if you process several data sets. So if you've got several, let's say, three wavelengths mad, or you've got uh, data from a Capricorn you start in, in different orientations, it takes great care of ensuring that already during the data processing, everything is consistent. The indexing is consistent, the orientation matrices are consistent, and it will already scale everything together. So it's tr it tries to avoid that, um, that, that the data sets only see um, itself, but not each other. Um, and that can make sometimes a bit of a difference. Okay. Um, pseudo translation, do you guys handle it right now in any special way? Or because I know that was one of the hot topics recently. Pseudo translation, that's a good question. I I don't okay. think it would make a big, it would give a big problem in the heavy atom phasing. I'm not quite sure if it does it give a problem in the heavy atom detection. I know it it gives problems in molecular placement, but um, let's put it this way: I haven't I haven't seen a, a case where. Um, everything points to a very good heavy atom signal, and we weren't able to solve it. And we know it's due to the to the um, to the translation. Okay. And uh, so the last question, I think, uh, to just pick from the list right now. Uh, I, I think typically people go to synchrotron, and I think we we usually forget to get the good estimates for F prime and F double prime. Mm -hmm. And that happened quite often. And then you go a week later, try to run sharp, and you realize that you don't really have the accurate numbers. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to take them from the expected values? How sensitive the refinement is to, to really accurate estimates for the F prime and F double prime? Um, so it depends on two things. If you do a sad experiment, it doesn't really matter because um, it's only the F double prime that counts, and the occupancy and the F double prime value are just correlated. So you, if you're if you're off by a factor of two, the occupancy will be multiplied or divided by two. So that shouldn't matter. If you are reasonably far away from the edge, again, it shouldn't matter. You know, the calculated values are basically identical to the to the observed ones. If you do a, a seven, if you do several wavelengths and you do an inflection and a peak, um, it can make a difference. If you if you got a very good good signal. And then sharp um, or auto sharp will actually, even with wrong values, it will find the heavy atom sites, and it will then actually tell you through the log like you're creating maps. Hey, you have to refine this one, or you have to uh, refine the other one. If you got bad data and uh, poor heavy atom signal, then um, the, the refinement and the phasing in these log like you're creating maps can be too noisy to give you that bit of information, and then it can be tricky. So usually. 
Um, so the, the worst case scenario is if you go to the synchrotron and don't even do a fluorescent scan and just put it to the wavelengths um, that you always use to collect the selenium peak. Now that is, um, you know, that can be quite dangerous because every single crystal or every crystal form can have the peak slightly shifted. It's a different chemical environment of seleniums that can be shifts around it. And um, we know from, from anisotropy of anomalous scattering that even if you rotate the crystal by 90 degrees, you might get a shift of the, the peak. Um, so I would highly recommend doing a fluorescent scan. It usually on modern beam lines is really only a one button case. If you collect the second crystal uh, of the same crystal form, you don't probably have to redo it, but um, ideally you should do it. Okay, great advice. Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you again for joining us today from from Cambridge. Yeah. And, uh, are you attending ACA or Gordon conference? Any of the upcoming meetings in the US? No, n neither of them. I'm going to the ECM in Bergen, Norway. So okay. uh, yeah, but Gordon and the ACA, <laughs> they 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 move the dates around, so it would be three week thing, I guess. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Well, well, thank you for 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 your presentation today. And then, as you mentioned, we have the Sharp server right now available to the to all SB Grid members, and we'll be getting the new version in place as soon as it's uh, released. Yeah. Then we'll compile it. And if you guys have any comments, further questions, or or suggestions for further webinars, just email Michelle Ottaviano. Uh, she announced this one to you, so uh, we'll take it into consideration. And uh, I'll, I'll hope to talk to everybody soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clemens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.